give me what I want, I think. Who for? Um, well, it was certainly the first one I ever had published. <clears throat> and I don't think I wrote anything before that. Uh, how did you get a publishing deal? How did that come about? Um, the band I was in, the VI, well, started off as the Vibratones and then became the VIPs. And one of the band, his sister worked for Chapels Publishing. And uh, I got the deal through that. One of them came down and saw the band or something. Rehearsing. And uh, I got the deal through that. I can't remember it any more than that. I think it was one of those times when, because it was sort of very early 60s, when publishers were kind of signing up anyone who was in a band. So were you tempted with money? Do you know what? I never even understood the concept of publishing money. The biggest mistake I ever made, I think. I never understood that it worked the way it works. I never understood that the people who wrote the stuff made more money than the people who recorded it. Because I never thought in those terms. I always thought in performance terms. Um, so, no. And I don't think I got... If I got any money at all, it was, it was minimal. No, I don't think it was much in the way of money involved. It was just... I'm like everyone at that age, I was just sort of thrilled I suppose to be signed to a major anything and <laughs> chapels were yeah. huge and big publishers so it was more a question of that than anything else so what happened after that then what did did it make any sort of um, impact on the chart or no um, but if you know for me it was just I mean I was what 16 and I've got my name as writer on a record you know which was like okay and like th that happened three times. Um, we did this again. You see, is me being thick. <clears throat> but no, not thick. Ignorant. I got thick later. Um, I wrote the song. We recorded the song, uh, "Hot Blooded Lover," which is a bloody awful song. But it was on the B side. Of, they used it as the B side of a thing called uh, "We Love You Beatles." And that got in the American charts. Now, if I'd have known now, I do know now, if I'd have known then what I know now, I would have known that the writer gets the same amount of money whichever side of the record it's on. Right. So probably I should have made a, a fair amount of loot out of that, but I never saw any of it. It didn't. And were you the only writer for Hot Bloody Lover? Yeah. Um... But I never saw any of it. But I didn't know. You know, and there's no way on God's earth in this country is anyone that's going to sign you up to any kind of deal going to tell you. <laughs> so I didn't know. So, you know, I probably lost out on a few quid then, but it's, I mean, God blimey, it's so long ago. Do you know what I mean? It was before the Boer War, that. Did you make any money from publishing at all? Either with the Rubettes or the firm? Or... Oh, we must have made something with the Rabbits. Not with the firm, I never wrote anything with the firm. Um, but we must have, uh, yeah, we must have made something with the, the rabbits because we were getting a lot of airplay. But that all got lumped in with, I mean, you have no idea what's coming in from where when you're in a band like that. You know, you know there are royalties coming in, please God. But they might be from airplay, they might be from sales, you know what I mean? You just, you have no, you just have no idea. And you have no time to find out. That's because, I mean, we never stopped work. For four years, we never stopped work. Or virtually never. The odd week. Um, but when we were working, it was like a 24-hour-a-day thing. How do you mean? What happened? What were you recording? What was the first thing you recorded? First thing I recorded was tonight, I think. Or it might have been, no, hang on, might have been the B-side of Sugar Baby Love. Which would have been what? Buddy Holly Days, was it? Possibly. Look that up, Kurt. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so tonight, are you playing guitar on tonight? Yeah. And singing? Oh, yeah. I'm the highest harmony on tonight. You really? The one right at the very, very top, yeah. Upstate in the penthouse. <laughs> Why would that have been? Well, I mean, there's no reason for it. It's just that 
we, you know, when we worked harmony stuff out, we just worked it out. You do this, you know, you take the third, I'll take the fifth, I'll take the fifth amendment. And um, however it ended up getting built is how it got built, you know. And uh, I presume, I can't remember, I presume that when we put that together, it wanted an higher harmony and I just did it. And that made it right. So we just recorded it that way. It was all, you know, very... Those things were very improvised, mostly, like that, in the studio. Was there a conscious effort to make tonight similar to Sugar Baby Love? Well, yeah. But, I mean, not as bad as some, because it's... I don't think it is that similar, but, I mean, Wayne and Tony were writing all this stuff. Um, you know, they had their own agenda for the way they were writing stuff. And everybody, if someone has hit record, no one's going to come out with a follow-up that don't sound anything like it. No. Um, Do you think it's a better record? I like Tonight Better as a record, yeah. What do you think of Sugar Baby Love? I was... I wasn't all that impressed with it when I heard it. You know, because, I mean, that was the lure. That was what got my John Richardson phone me up. Um, we've got this track, and it's. I think it's. Uh, I think it's fabulous. I think it's a big chance of being a, a smash. Uh, but when he played it to me, I thought, well, okay, it's all right, you know. But I wasn't over impressed with it. How did you go about learning the material for uh, the recording sessions? Were you given chord charts or sheet music or? No, the only time we ever got, we were never given anything. The only time we used any kind of cold chart was if one of the band wrote something. So how did you record things like um, Tonight and all the things that Wayne Bickerton wrote and Tony Waddington? This is probably sounds mental, but we were all not necessarily the greatest musicians on the planet, but we'd all spent so much time in bands, various bands, and doing sessions, or whatever. That when we walked into a studio, it was just kind of a question of getting on with it, like any other job that you're used to doing. It's like you know, painters walking into the house and going, "You're all right, Mrs. We want, want that green, want that bit down there. Okay, leave it to us," and getting on with it. It just felt perfectly natural, perfectly easy, you know. Um, so we'd get the song Wayne had, uh, in the first place in the early days Wayne had, had placed the song and we'd sit down and we'd play through it and then we'd, we'd sort of build an arrangement for it until we got an arrangement we were happy with and then we'd uh, we'd record that and then we'd put the lead vocal on and then get round the mic and do the vocal harmonies it was round one mic as I remember it yeah and would you say that every member of the band um, was a, an adequate singer? No, I mean, I think every member of the band was a bleeding good singer. And the blend, the vocal harmony blend, was magic. Absolute magic. I mean, we did, you know, there was no... You didn't have to uh, find a way of faking that. We used to do, um, after the Gold Rush, the Neil Young song, we used to do it that a cappella on live gigs. Um, and it always made the ears on the back of my neck stand up, the sound of that blend. It was just glorious, you know. Was there a, a musical director in the band at all? No. Anyone who took charge? No. No. No, I mean, if someone had an idea, they'd have to show it to everybody else, you know, explain what they were, what they were doing. But no, there's no, no, it was, um, it was very democratic. Do you remember democracy? Vaguely. We used to have one here once. <clears throat> uh, well, it was uh, go back to the ancient Greeks then. It was just democratic's not even the word for it. It was just the way we worked, the way everybody worked in those days. You know, if anybody had an idea, they'd say so, and if everybody else thought it was all right, we'd use it and we'd just put those things together. You know, there's a it lot. Was a, the reason I'd say about it being a good band was, you know, everyone knows the story now about when we went and do the first top of the pops, and they told us we couldn't use the. the original the track we had to remake the track um and polydor found us a studio and we re-recorded sugar baby love in hour and a half the whole track yeah backing vocals as well yeah um 
Well, I mean, you can't do that unless you know what you're doing and unless you can just walk in and do it. Do you know what I mean? But it, they were, we were young, but we were experienced. So was that on the day of the Top of the Pop show? Yeah. So not only was it recorded and arranged, but it was mixed and mastered in a day? Well, it had to be, yeah. Well, less than a day. I mean, we did, we went, when we got the, the Beeb, Television Centre, which is now defunct, um, every time I go somewhere, they end up pulling it down. <laughs> um, <laughs> we did the first camera run in the morning, about 11 o'clock or something, and we came out of there at 12, one-ish, I don't know, something like that, and were told then by a bloke from the MU that we couldn't use the track. Well, the next camera run through was something like four o'clock. So we literally, um, I mean, this was completely out of the blue. We didn't know anything about that. So... Polydor had to find us a studio. I can't remember what studio, but they managed, they just had to phone around and find one. And then we all had to get in the car. I mean, we didn't have any gear with us. We had our guitars with us. That's all we had. And then we had to get from there to the studio, redo the track completely, and then get back in time for the run-through using the track we'd just recorded. So, I mean, it, it was... But you did it, you know. If, if you know what you're doing, you can do things like that. Did I have one? Apparently so, yeah. Don't look like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, I'd, I didn't think I had a signature. I mean, I developed one a bit later on when it, we started going country-ish because that was my sort of direction, you know, the old famous Strat thing, um, which wasn't so common. I mean, it beca everybody ended up doing it, which is why I stopped playing Strats to some extent. Um, I first heard that sound, I think, um, well, Rory Gallagher, but that particular kind of Strat sound, I first heard that on an Amazing Rhythm Aces album, right? because they used that, that, you know, the old uh, out of phase thing. Um, but I wasn't even using a Strat when we started with the Rubettes, was I? I was using my little Burns. And w why did you take the decision to, to drop the Burns? Well, I didn't. I just always wanted a Strat, and I'd never had the money. So uh, once I had enough money to buy a uh, Strat, I bought a second-hand Strat. Um, I had to have the pickups. Like someone had messed with the electrics. But I took it somewhere and had the pickups. So it wasn't right. brand new then? No, no. Um, and... Uh, I used that most of the time after that, that strat. I liked that strat. Um, what happened to it? I sold it. Powered gas bill. When would that have been? 80s, 90s? It must have been the 80s, because Clay was young then. And how did the, the, uh, the Dick Knight, Tony Thorpe signature guitar come about? Well, it was one of those things that everyone was doing at the time, wasn't it? They would have a signature guitar made. And I liked the idea of a telly. Although I had two American tellies, and I didn't like either of them. It's bizarre, isn't it? I mean, I've got two tellies now that, that are neither of them are Fenders. One was made for me by uh, Brian Eastwood, and the other one's a, a Vesta Oriental thing. And they're fabulous. But I had two American ones, I didn't like them, but I always liked the, the, the body shape of a telly, but I felt, well, if I get that, but have the top cutaway the same as the bottom cutaway, um, that would look rather nice, and a uh, couple of Gibson humbuckers on it, and I was aware of, Hank Marvin at the time was using a, a, a strap with two humbuckers on and three switches, three, three little switches on. Um, and I bumped into him at Top of the Pops and he had this guitar in his hand. And I asked him what the switches were for and he told me the, the, the two outer ones under the pickups were um, to cut out one of the coils so it turned them into single coil pickups and the one in the middle put them out of phase. And I thought, oh, that's... And I just, one thing and the other just sort of put it together. And I'd heard about Dick Knight. Somebody, I don't know whether one of the band had had something 
I've done by Dick Knight a bit. I'd heard of Dick Knight, and I've just put it sort of all together in the head. And thought, that sounds like a nice idea, you know what I mean? So I went and had Dick Knight build it for me. And it recently turned up in Guitar and Bass magazine. Yeah, well, I had to sell that and all. <laughs>